So we're here to talk about rights of nature. What if nature had rights? And more accurately, it's what if our society recognized that nature had rights and behaved accordingly is the real question there. And that's what we're gonna be discussing today. Rights of nature, where basically we agree that nature has a right to exist, to thrive, to flourish, and to have its health restored. So it's not just about stopping the damage that we're doing, it's about restoring the health for the damage that we've already done. So that's what we're about. And I guess tonight's part of that. We're gonna be focusing in the very near future on starting a ballot measure that can, it's going to involve rights of nature. So we're gonna have a ballot measure focusing on rights of nature. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's really good. I mean, what we're gonna be talking about a lot here tonight is things that are happening all over the world. So we're kinda, it's a good thing pointing that out and saying we should be doing the same similar things here. It shouldn't just be happening at other places. We should be doing it here in Lane County. Okay. From there, I'm gonna briefly describe Community Rights Lane County, which Rights of Nature, Community Rights Lane County is a part of the group, Community Rights Lane County. We're basically a group of people that are specifically focusing on rights of nature. But Community Rights Lane County has a, I guess you could say a bigger focus. And as the name implies, community rights is that focus. And by that, what I mean is basically stating local communities have a right to protect their own health, their safety, and their well-being, and that of the ecosystem around them, too. And that's what community rights is when we're talking about community rights Lane County. And that happens a lot less than most people recognize. Most people think, oh, the government protects us and they protect our rights. That is not really accurate. Uh, for the most part, the government prefers and focuses on corporate rights and profits and everything that implies, and property rights and all of that. So community rights basically says we have a right to protect ourselves against that. And that's what community rights Lane County focuses on. <laughs> Thank you. And also what you will find, I think it was on all the chairs, but also over on the table, is two things specifically that Community Rights Lane County is doing in the very near future is Chris Hedges is coming here to speak. And there's one, there's a big public event. And I believe earlier on the same day, there's more of a, like you can actually, it's a smaller event and that's more of a fundraising type thing. And it's just a small, I think it's like 50 some people or so that that pay tickets to spend time and, you know, beverages, good food, catered food, all that. So, and then there's also democracy school. And democracy school just basically teaches you, basically everything that I mentioned about community rights, Lane County and the government really not protecting us, democracy school points out that it's been pretty much that way from the beginning. That's not really that new. Um, sure, trends are happening and things are changing all the time, but if you go back and you educate yourself on the very foundation of our laws, um, property rights and corporate rights were firmly embedded from the very beginning as the highest priority. So, Okay, now that we're done with that, I'm going to basically just quickly <laughs> go through a list of organizations and businesses that have helped out supporting rights of nature. And some of it is specific to this event, but some of it is just in general that these are local businesses and organizations that they support rights of nature and we should recognize that. So I'm just gonna go off it really quickly because we're short on time. Down to Earth, Oregon Wild, Pacific Green Party, Lane County, 350 Eugene, Indivisible Eugene, our Revolution Lane County, Cascadia Wildlands, Our Forests, Forest Web of Cottage Grove, Black Perry Pie Society of Cottage Grove, Beyond Toxics, Cornbread Cafe, Solidarity Eugene, Full City Coffee Roasters, Sundance, and Growers Market. So. <laughs> And then really quickly, I want to recognize where we're at and all of us to recognize and give respect to the location that we're at. We're at and what I mean by that is the Mini Nations Longhouse. Uh, just aesthetically, I think this is a beautiful place, beautiful structure, but also I think it has a really positive spirit. And we should recognize 
the place and, to be honest, those that are primarily responsible for it being here. And that's the, there's nine Native American tribes that are pretty much associated with this place and it wouldn't be here without them. So I want to give recognition to that. And with that, really quickly, I want to just segue into recognizing Native Americans and indigenous people throughout the world have, we're talking about rights of nature like it's a relatively new thing and we're just starting to wake up to it, which is accurate within our society. But in a lot of indigenous cultures throughout the world, it's been part of their society and the way they viewed the world from the beginning. And they've been fighting us, basically fighting against the damage we've been doing because they believe in that. They've been doing that from the beginning. And I want to give respect to that. And I also want to recognize it's not just them on the sidelines and us not paying attention to them, which has been way too much in the history of things. But as we are starting to wake up to rights of nature, they are heavily involved in it. In fact, as an example, within a rights of nature as part of Ecuador's constitution, the indigenous people were in a large way responsible for that happening. It wasn't just bureaucrats, et cetera, deciding, oh, let's have rights of nature and make a law on that. There was people fighting for a long time to make that happen, and they eventually influenced the government, and they were involved with making the government do that. And that's not the only place that happened. So I just want people to recognize that. When we talk about it being relatively new and stuff, that's because it's relatively new in our culture at least the fact that we're just starting to wake up and recognize that they exist, the rights of nature. And our three panelists, in the order they will be speaking, are Cameron La Follette. She's gonna be speaking, basically giving a basic overview of rights of nature and the social idea that underlies it. So that's a good way to start things. Chris Maser will he'll talk more about the ecological underpinning of why rights of nature is really the only framework that will allow our world to survive. Basically, the only framework that's truly going to put us in a sustainable frame of living. And then Craig Kaufman, he will be speaking more about looking at how rights of nature has actually become a law and has taken place in other places around the world, success stories and some failures too, and basically making an analysis about that because that can help us, what should we be doing here by paying attention to what's been happening elsewhere and what has failed and what has been successful. Uh, I, my name is Cameron LaFollette um, and I am, among other things, a researcher and an author. Uh, last year I co-authored, lead authored this book, uh, Sustainability and the Rights of Nature in Introduction with Chris Maser, um, which was published by CRC Press. And over on the Lane County Rights of Nature community rights table, there's a flyer from the press about it if you're interested in the book. CRC Press unfortunately overpriced it and I couldn't talk them out of it. Um, but if you're interested in it, you could either pay them the money that they're asking for it or uh, get a local, a local library to get a copy of it, which many communities have done. So I want to give an overview of rights of nature um, worldwide, just to give you a perspective of what's actually been happening and what has been not happening. Uh, rights of nature is a, a, a legal sh a shorthand, essentially, for uh, providing legal personhood for um, making a, an enforceable legal framework for relationship with nature or a unit of nature. That is, the underlying idea is relationship. The underlying idea is not, we'll see you in court. Uh, that might actually be the case, uh, and in many cases, in many situations it has been, but the real idea is a relationship between humans and nature. Uh, uh, in case it wasn't obvious, ours is broken. Uh, and it's very broken, and it's getting more broken worldwide, not just in this country and with Anglo-American culture, but worldwide. The industrial paradigm has been widely and enthusiastically adopted all over the world with disastrous and increasingly disastrous consequences for nature. So the idea of rights of nature fundamentally is to restore the relationship with nature, thereby saving human culture, um, by not having human concerns be primary. In any relationship, uh, if one person is primary and dominant and the other person is in a slavey type of position, that's not a very good relationship. That's not what we're talking about here. 
we're talking about is restoring a relationship with nature that is a relationship where both parties listen to each other, where there's compromises, where there's changes, where there's learning to live together so that both flourish. And when it often gets down to the I'll see you in court kind of thing, remember that the underlying idea is relationship. So Western culture, Western European-based culture, uh, has had in the recent time period, let's say the last six or seven hundred years, relatively recent, uh, one instance of shaping society based on relationship, and that's the feudal era in the Middle Ages in Europe. Now, and we wrote a chapter on that in this book, which might seem an odd thing to talk about with respect to rights of nature, but the important thing about the feudal era is it was based on relationship. And it was based on responsibility between partners, between the king and the knight, between the knight and the lord of the manor, between the lord of the manor and the serf. Yes, it was hierarchical. Yes, it was only between people and didn't include nature. But the point is it provides a framework from which to begin. That is, it, it, I often hear people say, well, we don't have any such idea in our culture, so we can't do it. And I want to say to that, that isn't true. There was a time in Western culture in which relationship and responsibility was the framework in which the culture was shaped. And even though changing it would be essential to make it work for rights of nature, of nature the point is that it's there. Uh, and of course, as John mentioned, uh, re reciprocity and relationship with nature is common in indigenous philosophy worldwide. And by the way, that includes indigenous European thought. Uh, if you look at the indigenous literature of Ireland, of Scotland, of France, of uh, Eastern European countries, of Italy, you can find a lot of the same kinds of uh, respectful, shamanic, relationship-based attitudes towards nature. They have gotten smothered under the Enlightenment and especially the Industrial Revolution, but smothering doesn't mean dead. It just means smothered. So let me talk for a minute here about how the idea of rights of nature as we know it in the, its modern incarnation, how it began. Uh, it began in the lawsuit Sierra Club versus Morton in 1972 in a kind of a convoluted way. Uh, the Disney Corporation wanted to build a ski resort in Mineral King Valley uh, in California. The Sierra Club Legal Defense Fund sued to stop it, and they were rebuffed because they d could not show, to use legal terms, that they had injury to provide standing. That is, they couldn't show that, it, that there were, was any direct immediate injury to their members to, pr to go to a court and say, this is going to hurt us, so therefore we can argue against this um, ski proposal. Uh, a University of Southern California law school professor named, ironically, Christopher Stone, um, authored a law review article arguing that natural areas and objects should have legal rights. Uh, and his goal in writing it at that time was to influence the United States Supreme Court justices who were hearing this case. It had been appealed up to them. So uh, that essay, which is called Should Trees Have Standing, has become a, a um, a popular classic, it has just been reprinted in like its 11th reprinting. So up at the US Supreme Court, the Sierra Club lost the case. Um, however, Justice William O. Douglas, who was from Washington State, dissented from the majority opinion and he wrote, contemporary public concern for protecting nature's eco ecological equilibrium should lead to the conferral of standing upon environmental objects to sue for their own preservation. Uh, and his dissent has also become quite famous. So after various other legal shenanigans, the net result was Mineral King Valley was saved. It's now part of Sequoia National Park, in case you wondered what, what actually happened on the ground. Uh, but the reaction to Justice Douglas's dissent uh, and to Christopher Stone's article at the time was incredulity, discomfort, and ridicule uh, in the culture as a whole. <clears throat> it's perhaps best um, encapsulated by a piece of, I wouldn't call it poetry, maybe we could call it doggerel, uh, that appeared in the Journal of the American Bar Association in 1972 by John M. Naff, Jr., uh, a, a, a practicing attorney. Listen to this. If Justice Douglas has his way, oh, come not that dreadful day, we'll be sued by lakes and hills seeking your redress of ills. Great mountain peaks of name prestigious will suddenly become litigious. Our brooks will babble in the courts seeking damages for torts. How can I rest beneath a tree if it soon may be suing me? or enjoy the playful porpoise while it's seeking habeas corpus. 
Every beast within his paws will clutch in order to show cause. The courts besieged on every hand will crowd with suits by chunks of land. Ah, but vengeance will be sweet. Since this must be a true way street, I'll sue my neighbor's tree for shedding all its leaves on me. So, that was the initial reaction. Um, in, in actual fact, many pieces of what's needed to make a rights of nature uh, idea work in the United States already exist uh, in kind of separated fragments. For example, the Endangered Species Act creates guardianship where an agency or a nonprofit can sue for the benefit of an injured species. The Superfund law uh, sets up a way to assess damages and provide recovery for devastated ecosystems. Uh, the public trust doctrine uh, it was created by the courts to protect natural resources for the health and well-being of present and future generations. Courts, by the way, use the public trust doctrine uh, to curb governments trying to sell off public assets. Uh, and most recently, it's being used as the theory in the climate trust litigation that's uh, going on and is surely known to you since it came out of Eugene. What's lacking is a comprehensive, constitutionally mandated system of nature's rights not based on human rights. So let's look at what's happening in other countries. Uh, as John mentioned, uh, Ecuador is the flagship country here. Uh, they um, approved a new constitution in 2008. Uh, and it has many rights for different people and different groups of people uh, and some rights for all people. But it also has new language that says, quote, nature or Pachamama, where life is reproduced and occurs, has the right to integral respect for its existence and for the maintenance and regeneration of its life cycle, structure, functions, and evolutionary processes. Nature also has the right to be restored. Uh, the problem has been, as the courts now start to grapple with this, uh, is that nature's rights in the Constitution has to vie with all the other equally important rights that are all given equal amounts of power in the Constitution, so the balancing of the rights is turning out to be somewhat a problem. Nature is not always coming out uh, with the full ability to flourish. Uh, Bolivia, then, in its Mother Earth Law of 2010, uh, defines Mother Earth as, quote, a dynamic living system comprising an indivisible community of all living systems and living organisms, interrelated, interdependent, and complementary, which share a common destiny. I like that part, they share a common destiny. Um, her rights, that is uh, Pachamama's rights, to life, meaning to maintain the integrity of living systems, to the diversity of life without genetic or artificial modification, to clean air, uh, to equilibrium, including the right to maintenance of interrelationship, to restoration, and to pollution-free living from toxic and radioactive waste and other contamination. Uh, Bolivia followed that law up with hosting a World's People's Conference on Climate Change in Mother Earth in Cochabamba in 2010, uh, which involved activists from all over the world. And they promulgated the Universal Declaration of the Rights of Mother Earth, which was based on the Bolivian law. And this Universal Declaration, which is outside any legal system, um, has as its basic premise that Earth is a living being with the right to life and to exist. Not a strange idea if you're already in that mindset. If you're not in that mindset, a very strange idea. Uh, and the, the, at the conference also was created the Global Alliance for the Rights of Nature, uh, which in turn created an International Rights of Nature Tribunal to implement the declaration because it's completely outside any legal system to actually have a court that would uh, listen to and uh, make determinations on whether ra nature's rights have been violated is not in any legal system uh, in a fully functional way, neither national nor international. So this international tribunal, operating outside of any legal system, investigates cases of, net of environmental destruction and is catalyzing a new field, a whole new field of law called Earth Jurisprudence internationally, which is great. Uh, New Zealand has taken a different approach of applying rights of nature to specific, specifically culturally important pieces of land. Uh, for example, there was a 2014 law that granted 821 square mile Te Urawara National Park the status of legal personhood to protect it from threats. Uh, this was done in agreement with the, with the Maori clan that claimed the land as expressing their language, customs, and identity. 
So it was a unique fusion of Western legal concepts and indigenous uh, traditional concepts. Uh, then more recently, the Juan Ganui River has been protected the same way uh, in a partnership between the Juan Ganui Iwi and the New Zealand government. Uh, in the uh, legislation passed in 2017 to protect the Juan Ganui River as a legal entity, recognizing it as a person under the law, uh, and the allowed activities on it will be governed by the Maori view of the river via a non-Maori guardianship model. Uh, and this is the area that is, has just got so much um, fertile opportunity for creating fusions and new ideas to do the right thing. Uh, India has had a different experience. <clears throat> um, the basic problem is that the Ganges River, which is one of the greatest rivers in the world, is extremely, extremely polluted uh, with everything from um, uh, human wastewater, industrial pollution, animal and human corpses, uh, and uh, industrial effluent, and it, it, it's basically an open sewer. Um, the state court of Uttar Pradesh has granted the, it granted the entire Ganges watershed, which is a very large amount of land, legal personhood in 2017. Uh, and then the Supreme Court of India halted implementation of it. Uh, part of the reason being that in various interest groups, government officials, ritual practitioners, corporations, each focusing on their own uh, interests and powers have uh, sort of jammed up the opportunities to really move ahead on what needs to be done on the Ganges. And in this particular instance, rights of nature doesn't have a clear way to be implemented across so many competing interests. Um, and people who are working on the problems of the Ganges River are trying various solutions. It's not as straightforward uh, as what's happened in New Zealand. Uh, in the European Union, uh, there was a new nature's rights organization founded in 2015 uh, that is advancing a policy directive to place rights of nature in all European Union country constitutions via the European Parliament. Now we come to a country that's doing things very differently, Bhutan, uh, a Himalayan, landlocked Himalayan kingdom, uh, a non-legally based governance focused on caretaking for the rights of nature in order for nature to flourish. Bhutan still has 71% of its original forest cover. Um, more than half of Bhutan's land is in protected areas and the constitution mandates that 60% of its forest cover shall remain for all time to come. The constitution also requires the people of Bhutan to preserve, protect, and respect the environment. And they do a lot of uh, yearly planning and strategic plans uh, for the purpose of actually implementing these kinds of things on the ground, and it's working. Uh, Colombia recently, uh, also in South America, uh, has taken a leaf out of Ecuador's book, essentially. Uh, Colombia has no rights of nature in its constitution or laws, but the court system has started requiring protection, such as for the Amazon, in a rights of nature framework in court cases. And Ecuador's influence, not necessarily to do it exactly the same way as, uh, as Ecuador has done it, but the essential first step, you know, that somebody took an essential first step is really important. Uh, there are many options for increasing a rights of nature framework, even in a country like ours, which hasn't got any such thing, and many people hope that there will never be such a thing. Uh, one way to do it is major restoration projects, such as the Caledonian Forest in Scotland, which is a long-term project aiming to reforest the entire long denuded highlands, which used to be forested. They look like you know gorgeous barren hills now, but really they used to be forested. Uh, or the American Prairie Reserve Project in Montana, which aims to make the largest protected area in the US. Um, they're looking towards three million acres of private and public land stitched together to make, remake uh, a complete ecosystem in the prairie lands. There are many local options too, and I toss this out just so that people who are working on this or who want to be, um, um, uh, what's the right word, sort of um, astonished and mesmerized by the possibilities, even in a system like ours, uh, the American legal system is hierarchical, so rights of nature ordinances at local levels to stop harmful activities usually fail in court. Uh, Grant Township, Pennsylvania, tried to stop fracking wastewater reinjection, 
by local ordinance and the courts threw it out, uh, said that only state and federal law uh, can regulate that. Uh, most recently, Lincoln County, Oregon passed a uh, ordinance to stop aerial herbicide spraying. It was the first county in the nation to do that. In the nation. <laughs> I don't know how many counties there are in the nation, but many thousand. Um, so uh, the Siletz watershed tried via some attorneys to uh, intervene in the lawsuit uh, to protect its rights from aerial spraying, but the judge said no. So this is a continuing problem that needs to be continually battered against at every level. But in addition, there's other things you can do. For example, there's a rights of nature ordinance on the ballot to give Lake Erie rights uh, to stop the algal blooms caused by agricultural runoff that are um, harming hundreds of thousands of people's drinking water. There are also many local alternatives that one can do uh, that would not be struck down by courts as being uh, preempted by state or federal law. For example, uh, pass a local ordinance that governs a specific piece of land owned by that local government, specifying that it can only be um, taken care of via rights of nature framework. The local government can pass the ordinance because it owns that piece of land. That's not going to be preempted. Work with a land-owning tribe that is interested to have rights of nature placed in a tribal constitution or law on tribally owned lands. Create a rights of nature conservation easement where people can sell or donate an easement on their property for nature's purposes and have it be held by a land trust. Um, or frame a landscape scale restoration project according to rights of nature principles. And those are just a few ideas. Uh, there's lots of ways to do something uh, as long as we keep in mind the current uh, restraints on what can be done. What's most important in implementing this is to remember that it's a change of consciousness, it's a change in a way of understanding and living, and so any success, however small, is really important. Thank you. What we're dealing with is called conditioning. We grow up with and we're taught to have a certain perspective, which gives us a certain perception. And that conditioning in this case is in the negative. The reason it's in the negative is that we don't understand really how nature functions. Here are just a few words that we use inaccurately from a nature's point of view. We talk about efficiency, which is an economic term. Nature functions with effectiveness. It has nothing to do with efficiency. We talk about fragmentation. Don't fragment the habitat. So we fragment it. What we really mean is connectivity. Then the question becomes, how do we connect the habitats? How do we keep them connected as corridors so animals and plants can migrate from one area to the other? We talk about water sheds. A shed is a raincoat so that it sheds the water and you don't get wet. What we really mean is water catchments, that it catches the water, holds it so it can infiltrate the soil get underground, and ultimately end up in the ocean. We talked about cult carrying capacity, which means how many animals can live in an area without totally destroying their habitat. Governments, city particularly, talk about carrying capacity. How many people can we fit within the urban growth boundary? What we need to think about is cultural capacity. Cultural capacity means what quality of life do we want to have in a given area how much we treat that area, and how many people can be allowed in to maintain that cultural capacity. What that is saying is, in essence, this gentleman right here has given a brilliant speech and I want a meeting. So the question I must ask myself is, how must I treat him so he will likely respond the way I would like? So rather than with an acre of ground thinking about managing it, we have to ask ourselves, how must we take care of it to allow it to respond the way we would like. That's a totally different way of thinking. We talk about backups, redundancy. In governments and in economics, we talk about redundancy. Nature doesn't have redundancy, but it has backup systems. In every system, there are at least three species which have the same basic function. The first one is very susceptible to change, the second one less susceptible, and the third the least susceptible. 
if the third one becomes extinct in an area, we don't destroy the ecosystem. We're not omnipotent. What we do is alter its function, and what we destroy is capacity to serve us with our requirements for a good quality of life. Finally, the difference between monetary riches and true wealth. Monetary riches are just money. True wealth is a quality of life. This gets down to three basic laws of thermodynamics. The first law, the total amount of energy in the universe is constant. The second is the amount of energy in forms available to do useful work can only diminish over time. And an example of that is when you burn a piece of wood, it reorganizes itself to ashes. So you can't burn it again. The third one is called the law of maximum energy production, which I think is uh, not the best way to state it. But what it really says is energy will escape by the fastest means possible when a constraint is removed. Now, if you think about the growing cooler weather, we put on more clothing to constrain our loss of energy. In the heat of summer, we take them off to allow it to go. All we do as human beings ever is a dance with energy. That's all we do. Everything we do is based on letting go or conserving energy. So nature's laws of reciprocity build into this. The first law is everything is a relationship. The entire universe is a relationship made up of relationships of various sizes and shapes. All we humans do is practice relationships with one another, energy, and so forth. With this, there are no such thing as an independent variable. There's no such thing as a constant value other than the number one, which is what the universe is built on. Everything is built on ones. Nothing is inert, such as chemicals. That is, that's just a way of hiding the truth from people. You cannot have anything inert and have a relationship. All freedom is relative. There's no such thing as absolute freedom, so there's no such thing as a free market. It's a relationship. It has constraints. And all systems are open. So this idea of closed loop technology is bogus. The second law of reciprocity is that all relationships are dependent on and result in a transfer of energy. Conduits. There's no waste in nature. Everything is recycled. The third law is the only true investment of incoming energy is active energy from sunlight. And you can tell this when you eat lettuce. A plant has photosynthesis. That means it takes the minerals and the water from the soil, it's combined with carbon dioxide and water in sunlight, converts it to carbohydrates that nourishes the plant. When you eat lettuce, you're eating partly stored sunlight and partly minerals that have been recycled in the soil. If you then eat beef, you're eating totally recycled energy. So there's no such thing in the stock market as investment. It is all recycling what is already here. The only investment in the world is sunlight. All relationships are productive of an outcome. Now, whether it's good or bad is our decision based on what we want. To nature, it's all neutral. The fifth is change is a process of eternal becoming. And because change is always different, it's always novel, this will refer to another principle. Nothing is reversible. There isn't a single thing in the universe that's reversible because we can't go back in time. Therefore, there's no such thing as restoration. We can heal a process, but it will be different. It will function differently. The results may be similar. The sixth law of reciprocity is that all relationships are self-reinforcing feedback loops. Now, whether that loop is positive or negative depends on our human valuation. But I'll give you a very quick example. Salmon reproduce in the headwaters of forests. When they mature, they go out into the ocean. They're taking energy from the forest and transferring it into the ocean. Those that die out there 
give some of the force energy to the ocean. They mature in the ocean, they return to the rivers of their origin. As they go up the river, when they spawn, they die. They're taking energy from the ocean, transferring it to the forest. As they die along the edge, the trees and animals suck the nutrients out of the carcasses, including young salmon, so that when they get to the ocean, they can survive. That is a reciprocal feedback loop. The forest nourishes the ocean, the ocean nourishes the forest. Salmon is the way it's done. The seventh one is that all relationships have a trade-off. Think of a fork in the road. If you take the right-hand fork, you forgo everything in the left-hand fork, and vice versa. So whatever decision you make has a trade-off. You get this, but you forego that. All relationships are irreversible. You cannot go back in time. You cannot restore anything. I learned this from my mother during World War II when she was darning my socks. She had a, a bulb, light bulb. She darned the sock on it. When I put that sock on, the hole I had worn in it was stronger and different than the rest of the sock. What she did was mend the process so I could use the sock, but it was not the same sock. So nothing is restorable. It can be healed, it can be fixed, but the system will be different. All systems are based on composition, structure, and function. And for example, you're in a chair. The composition of a chair is the metal, the brace on the bottom, the legs, the back, the seat, all of the pieces. They are put together to form a structure. That structure allows a function. What is that function? To sit. So what happens if the seat is removed? You no longer have a chair. In a forest, it's the plant community that forms the structure. That structure allows a function and how that forest is working. The systems alterate, are altered by disturbances such as fire, floods, heavy snowpack, and so forth. And there are some negotiable, negotiability of constraints. We alter those systems all the time. Now we can look at the Multiple Use Sustained Yield Act is absolutely bogus. It's bogus because it's sustained yield. There is no such thing. There's only sustainable yield. If you sustain a yield, when you run out of whatever it is, you run out of yield, which has happened with clear cut logging all over the world. So what this comes down to is that we have to look at how we negotiate the constraints. And the constraint means asking, first of all, when is enough enough? Secondly, how must we treat this forest or this prairie so that it, we can take care of it in a way that we are allowing it, honoring it, so that it can produce and serve us with those things we need for quality of life on a sustainable basis, a biophysically sustainable basis through time, because every decision we make becomes the children's consequences for all generations to come. All generations. So every decision has an outcome. That outcome the next generation must be able to deal with. That's what we have to think about. The rights of nature gives that legacy to all generations. Deny the rights of nature and we steal that legacy from all generations. Looking at it from a habitat point of view, there are a couple of things that are missed in habitat. Traditionally, habitat is considered to be food, which is the major consideration, water, which is an uncompromising necessity of life, and shelter, which comes in many forms. But what's left out of that is space, is usually taken for granted when discussing habitat. But creatures have a requirement for different space. When I was working in Egypt, between the Arabic people and the British people, there was always a dance of space. If they were talking together, the Egyptians get right in your face because they don't have the same kind of boundaries. The Brits would back up. The Egyptians would move forward. The Brits, this dance went all around the room and it was all based on the required personal space. We do the same, three minutes? Oh boy. Well, I'm just gonna have to read the others. All systems are defined by their function. 
not by their pieces. All systems have cumulative effects, lag periods, and thresholds, which means like a disease, if you get a, enough bacteria, it takes time for it to incubate and suddenly you feel the results. And at that point, you know that you're sick. All systems are open. There's no such thing as a closed loop. There's no such thing as amber or a jelly jar. Amber is the closest and the jellies are the closest there are to a closed system, but they're still energy penetrating, so it's not really closed. All systems are cyclical. There are no perfect circles, but they all go back and approximate their beginning over time. The 14th is systemic change is based on self-organizing criticality. Systems alter continually, and an earthquake comes about when there's been enough tiny changes that a threshold is crossed and there are shifts. In Zion Canyon, there's a huge arch where the sandstone have been amalgamated as a dune. The dune gradually became rock and now over time it has been deteriorating because of rain. At one point in time, a single grain of sand held that whole thing together. When that grain gave way, that whole arch fell. And the last one is, there is no such thing as the balance of nature. This is a, a dream, that if you do something in nature and you reverse it, nature balances itself. Nature, all rules are disequilibrium. There's no balance of nature. It's constantly shifting from one change to another change because change is constant and it's novel. There's no reversibility. In closing this, if we understand these principles of reciprocity and we honor them, we are practicing the rights of nature. But we have to get rid of the conditioning of use more and more and more, and it's all about money and power. We cannot manage anything. We are not in control except here. This is what we have to change. When is enough enough? And how do we take care of the system that honors us by honoring it? Thank you. I'm Craig Kaufman, a political scientist here at UO. Uh, and when I think about rights of nature, I, I tend to think of it in terms of the political strategies uh, that are used to try to implement rights of nature, uh, the, you know, the pushback that happens, the obstacles, and then strategies for overcoming those. So I want to talk a little bit about that uh, in a macro perspective. I'm going to do that by uh, describing the evolution of rights of nature legal provisions over the last decade, because there has been an evolution in response to obstacles and challenges and a decision about strategies for going forward. Uh, and so the first, the early laws, uh, which were, you know, for example, in Ecuador and Bolivia, as Cameron described, uh, the model was uh, that all of nature has rights, so you define nature, first of all, as all of nature, and because these came out of, um, as was described, the indigenous efforts to codify in Western law their understanding of humans' relationship to the natural world, it got defined as Pachamama, uh, and, then, and then rights of nature was this Western concept that was going to be used as a tool for being able to achieve this notion of summa causa, or this ba balance between humans and, and nature. Uh, and so the rights given were, as were just described, essentially the right to, for the ecosystem to maintain its functioning and to be restored if damaged, right? Uh, and then the other component of these laws is who gets to speak for nature? And is anyone actually required or obligated to do so? Uh, so the early laws in Ecuador and Bolivia uh, recognized rights for all of nature, um, defined very expansively, um, and they were these rights for maintaining the cycles uh, and, and to be restored. And, uh, and then they, the law said that anybody has the ability to speak on nature's behalf. So you know, if anybody thinks they see a violation of nature's, not, uh, nature's rights, they could go to a court and file a you know, petition or lawsuit and what have you. Uh, over the last decade, but nobody was obliged specifically to do so. It was just sort of understood that since anybody could do it, somebody surely would step up, right? 
Um, over the last decade, there's been a trend to a very different model of how you would implement rights of nature. Um, rights, the, 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 the recent rights, really since Ecuador and Bolivia, n now only recognize rights, the laws uh, or legal provisions, recognize rights for a very specific ecosystems, and I'll explain in a second why that's the case. Uh, and then they delineate a more expansive notion of rights. The more recent rights uh, laws uh, list not only the right to maintain the functioning of ecosystems uh, and to be restored, but also to flourish, which is actually, you might not think that that's a subtle change, but when you get into having to write standards for how you would know in any specific situation whether there's a violation, it's quite different for a reason I'll explain in a second why, there, why you know, if you're going to set flourishing as the right, it's quite different. It implies very different standards than if it's just to maintain the cycling. Uh, so that matters in that sense. Uh, and then the guardianship model has also, also evolved. Um, so the first thing I want to talk about is, is the reason why, for the shift to having laws recognize rights for very specific ecosystems rather than just all of nature. Uh, and in essence, the logic is that, uh, as both Cameron and Chris explained, really what's the ultimate goal is a paradigm shift, right? To have people reconceptualize their understanding of their relationship with nature. To do that, you're going to have to have mass popular buy-in to this idea of rights of nature, right? To start mobilizing public support. Uh, the lesson of past laws is that it's really hard to do that when you talk about nature in the abstract. Um, it's a lot easier to do that if you can identify a very specific concrete element of nature that has a lot of national symbolism and therefore is beloved by a community and mobilize, that gives a very specific image or face uh, to the problem and you recognize rights for that. So, uh, so for example, in Nepal, you have uh, the rights uh, for the Himalayas. In Australia, the movement for the rights of the Great Barrier Reef. In India, rights for the Ganga River, uh, so forth and so on, right, uh, is the logic. And, and that's a conscious strategy to try to mobilize support because I've done, uh, you know, the experience in Bolivia and Ecuador is that um, you, you know, when you interview even people who self-identify as defenders of mother nature, indigenous groups, for example, in Tipnis who are fighting against extractivism, uh, they have not been invoking the rights of Mother Earth law, and I've interviewed them to try to understand why and, and to give you a sense of, what, of why not. Uh, one of the things they say is, oh, it's, it's just poetry, right? It doesn't, it's, it's, it's not real. You, you know, for a law to fight in the legal system, you need something tangible and specific, right? That just sort of gives you a sense. Um, so you see that. All, all, all the recent laws now, now do that. And so the idea is that it can be a practical, more pragmatic or practical strategy, not only for protecting important ecosystems to begin with, but also then building support over time to try to expand rights for all of nature. Um, since we're talking at, in terms of education as a strategy for overcoming obstacles, this obstacle of the need, you know, the paradigm, um, one of the major impediments we've seen to the implementation of rights of nature laws, even after you get them passed, is that um, you know, eventually they do get to some regulatory agency or a court. And the problem is the idea of rights of nature is antithetical to the training that lawyers and judges get, right? Uh, and so there is a concerted movement to try to train lawyers and judges in law school. And so I'm part of a, a project uh, coordinated by the Earth Law Center. And we're writing a textbook. Uh, to be used in law schools, and a number of law schools have signed up to use that. But that's recognized as a major problem, and there is a concerted strategy to, to deal with that, not only here in the U.S., but around the world. And that strategy is paying off because, as you, we've seen, as you train lawyers and as lawyers and judges become more familiar with it and understand not only the concept behind it, but then also how you would interpret these laws when there are going to inevitably be competing rights, as, as Cameron said. So. Um, we're starting to see around the world um, judges invoking rights of nature, even when ni neither the claimants nor the defendants invoke it. Uh, so in Ecuador, for example, there has been an evolution of rights of nature jurisprudence as lawyers and judges 
um, come, become more familiar with it through training. Uh, and they're not environmentalists, necessarily. Mo most of them are not. I've interviewed a whole bunch of them. Uh, but they say, look, it's in our Constitution. We have a professional duty as judges to try to interpret the law. The reality is the law this is in the law. Uh, and in this case, I see that rights of nature impacts this case. And so you are seeing the evolution uh, and strengthening very gradually and slowly, um, but it is happening. Um, and then we're also seeing in places like India and Colombia, um, judges strategically interpreting existing laws that do not recognize rights of nature uh, in a way to justify arguments for recognizing rights of nature. Um, and I can give some examples of that in a second. Uh, but before I get that, do that, I wanted to, to um, get at the, th the third uh, sort of evolution, which is the, the evolution in guardianship uh, and the lessons about that. Right? So the, the early guardianship models was that um, you know, anyone can speak for nature, but nobody is specifically obliged to do so. Uh, the more recent laws were modeled after New Zealand, where you have specific guardians are named and assigned responsibility, meaning they are obliged, their whole job is, is to um, consider the interests and rights of that ecosystem and to represent those interests in any, not just in court, but in any government agency. And then importantly, you embed the guardianship model in new governance structures that are created in order to allow for integrated management of the ecosystem. So this gets at sort of the governance structures for dealing with the situation that Chris described, right? So it's not enough. One of the things we're learning is that it's not enough just to pass a law and recognize the rights. It's not even enough to then name guardians. Uh, you then, in order to so avoid the problem where everything has to go to the courts, you know, and where it's not, it's going to be a long drawn out battle, uh, it's difficult and you may lose, you try to preempt all that by then embedding the guardians in, with, into a collaborative, integrated ecosystem management body where you have all the local stakeholders, but the guardians are one of the stakeholders, speaking on behalf of the, of the river or the forest or whatever the ecosystem has. Uh, and so that's, that's a model that you're starting to see um, develop more. And so New Zealand pioneered that, but Colombia is really taking it to the next level, and we're learning a lot about that. Um, how much time I got? I'd say about seven minutes. Oh, excellent. Uh, so I guess another way to illustrate the obstacles are to and strategies for overcoming them is to describe the very different pathways that are being used to implement rights of nature in different countries, right? So, you know, a lot of people say, ah, oh, yeah, this idea of Pachamama and rights of nature in Ecuador, that might work in the Andes, but that's not gonna work in Sweden or the US or what have you. Um, yeah, maybe, and maybe not, right? But that doesn't mean that that, that has to be the only pathway, right? Um, and indeed, what we've seen is, you know, the places where you have these really strong constitutional mechanisms or very strong national laws, Ecuador, Bolivia, New Zealand, those came about through very unusual, unique openings of windows of political opportunity structures, political scientists like to call them, right? So in Bolivia and Ecuador, you had a very unusual situation where you had processes to totally rewrite the constitution at times when indigenous groups were politically influential, right? So it just sort of, it was a confluence of events that were unlikely to happen in elsewhere. And so they got to kind of put that into the Constitution. Right? In New Zealand, you had another kind of unique situation, which was a process for settling historical treaty violations between the Crown government and Maori iwi or tribes. Right? They were one on off. And interestingly, the, the Maori were not advocating for rights of nature because the concept of rights is sort of foreign, um, but rather rights of, na it was actually the lawyers for the Crown government that rec recognized that it could be a useful tool to overcome one of the negotiating obstacles, which was the Crown government had this very fragmented regulatory structure, right? As Chris said, that's the way we Westerners think. We break up the ecosystems in a fragmented way, and the law, was, the Resource Management Act was designed that way, and they weren't going to give that up. But on the other hand, the Maori iwi were insisting 
on the recognition of, in the case of the Wanganui River, the, the river ecosystem, the watershed, as a living spiritual being that's an integral whole. Uh, and it was the chief negotiator for the, the Crown government that recognized, hey, we, you know, they were familiar with the writings of Christopher Stone and others, and he recognized, you know what, if we rec gave legal personhood status to the watershed, that would kind of legally approximate this idea of the, and, and then we put in the treaty recognition of all the spiritual elements or components that the Maori were asking for. That would approximate legally this, this notion that's an integrated whole with, you know, being. Uh, and then, then we could just simply make, and then we could assign guardians, and then we could just say that that legal person, um, Te Awatupua, is subject to the Resource Management Act, <laughs> we, right? Uh, which is fragmented, but you could then create an integrated watershed management body made up of all the local stakeholders that would be um, tasked with trying to figure out how you manage Te Awatupu, you know, land use in Te Awatupu in a way that meets the Resource Management Act, but also in a, treats it as Te Awatupu, right? So that's kind of how that came up. And it was, Colombia actually borrowed the New Zealand model much more than the Ecuador model, because when it had the problem of the Atrato River, another area where you have indigenous groups, um, this is a good example of a pathway where they said, look, we don't have, they didn't have strong, they didn't have any national law that recognized rights of nature. Um, and, but they had a situation, they had a constitution that has recognized um, indigenous rights and it had some environmentally progressive elements to it, you know, for environmental protection, not unlike some of the things that Cameron described for the U.S. Constitution. And Judge Jorge Palacio strategically interpreted these constitutional features in a way to craft this legal argument of biocultural rights, essentially arguing that you cannot protect the rights of indigenous communities in these areas, which were protected and recognized by the Constitution. And you can't, because they rely so heavily on the local ecosystems, uh, you, you can neither recognize and protect the community rights and indigenous rights that are recognized, nor can you, it, you know, essentially if you don't allow for the environmental protection and you can't allow for the environmental protection if you don't recognize rights of the ecosystem itself independent of human concern. And so essentially argue that these are biocultural rights. Right? So a, kind of a unique legal argument that's rooted in the Colombian, allows them to take the Colombian constitution that does not explicitly recognize rights of nature and have the constitutional court say, yes, there is rights of nature recognized based on these constitutional principles. You similarly have, a you know, in the Indian case is another good example of where a judges have strategically interpreted existing laws uh, to recognize rights of nature when there are no laws that actually explicitly do so, right? So, but again, it was a judges taking advantage of, of particular legal doctrines that already existed in the Indian Constitution. In this case, they have something called public interest litigation, which is a way for marginalized groups in society, uh, if, they, if, they're, if they are suffering from a problem, that's recognized and the state has not taken adequate measures to address that problem, uh, these groups can use public interest litigation to appeal to a court to try to have courts enforce essentially politicians to do something that they're reluctant to do. <laughs> uh, and so India has a long history of environmental public interest litigation uh, and that's how the Ganga lawsuit started it went through the normal process. It's just that the judge got so frustrated at the government's refusal to abide by the court order that citing the New, e New Zealand precedent, um, decided to take the more dramatic step of recognizing rights. Um, now, interestingly, the way the, the judge justified it was declaring the, the legal doctrine of in loco parentis, which is, that's Latin for, 
or the parents of, right? And so this is a very common legal doctrine that exists in almost every Western constitution. It's what's invoked when you have, say, a small child or a disabled person who can't fend for themselves, and the courts appoint the court-appointed guardian to speak on behalf of this entity, this person, and take care of it. And so the judge essentially declared that, based utilizing the legal doctrine of public interest litigation for the court to intervene, uh, and then citing the government's failure response, uh, the court took, declared um, the river to be a legal person and then invoked in local parentis and the court appointed guardians on behalf of it. The reason why it went to the Supreme Court is because the court appointed the state governor to be the guardian. And the state governor said, whoa, 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 hey, what, what? No, I'm not being, does this mean that every time the river floods, and kills people, which happens every year, I'm gonna be sued? I'm gonna be responsible? No, 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 no. So I've interviewed the lawyer, and so it was the state governors, who were, it was the guardians who were appointed who appealed, am I doing the three? Okay, zero. So this is the end of the story, it's a good story. Uh, they were the ones who appealed, and so I've interviewed the lawyers for them, and they've made it clear that they don't actually oppose the concept of rights of nature. They just don't wanna be held responsible, and so, I. There's now a process to see if they can sort of restructure the guardianship model. Um, so there are important lessons there about how you structure the guardianship model. Okay, so we're going to start the question and answer. Um, unfortunately, this, this mic has a short cord, so you have to ask the question pretty loud. But I am going to highly encourage people to recognize other people want to ask questions too, so please do not go off giving your opinion in a strong, long way that's gonna take time away from other people asking questions too. You asked the question, who speaks for nature? And uh, who is the guardians of nature? You've equated nature's rights with laws, okay? Reach born and uh, we each have a certain time on this earth. The rivers, the earth, and all, all things in it all have their time. When you were born, the rivers were already here, the mountains were already here. Who has more rights? That's the question I have. The, dis the ultimate disconnect here that the gentleman um, referred to is is the real problem. It, you know, we're at some point we're still talking about humans granting nature rights. We're not talking about nature having its own rights and humans changing their societies and their cultures in order to recognize those and live in relationship. It's a very fine line and a very difficult one to uh, shape a culture around. The indigenous cultures around the world have shaped themselves over many generations uh, into relationships so that they can say uh, the river has its own rights, its own being, I am in relationship with the river. Uh, but that is, that's a level of consciousness that has been lost from Western culture by and large, most unfortunately, and which we need to get back. Uh, saying something like a rights of nature legal framework uh, whether a locally crafted one like in New Zealand or a broad scale one like the uh, provisions in the Ecuadorian constitution is kind of a halfway step. It, it's making an effort to uh, codify or uh, create a, a plaza where two parties that used to be in relationship but forgot how uh, can get back into relationship and begin the communion again that's necessary for relationship. Putting it very succinctly, indigenous cultures looked at the world systemically. They saw a system. They fitted themselves into the system as an inseparable component. Our conditioning is to look at things symptomatically, to have quick fixes, to get exactly what we want. We don't look at the whole system. We're not interested in the system yet. We want to fix a problem that's affecting us personally. In doing this, we're trying to move away from what we don't want. If I go into a restaurant and I'm on a diet and I'm asked what I want to eat and I say I don't want ice cream, how can you serve me? 
We have to start teaching in the positive so that we know what we do want. Then we can reach out for that and get it and understand that we are an inseparable part of this world. So the way we treat the world is the way we're treating ourselves. But basically, the way we treat ourselves is the way we're treating the world. Yeah, I mean, I'll just say that, so I was talking about laws because that was the subject of my talk. Uh, but, but I take the point of, the, of the, the, the person who made the question, which is, you know, as I said, there, the, ulti the laws are not the ultimate goal, right? The ultimate goal is to change the paradigm in order to change the behavior, in order to create a more sustainable relationship, right? It's just that, you, and, so may, and that's going to be easier in some cultures and harder in others. And so if you think that the biggest challenge is to, to change the Western culture, then that's kind of where I was focusing my remarks on. And the, you know, history tells us that laws can be a useful tool for changing culture in the face of resistance over time as people, you know. So I'll leave it at that. Um, I'm Ralph McDonald and um, I'm on the Sustainability Commission of Eugene, a, um, a, a commission that advises the City Council. They don't listen to us very much. <laughs> but um, I'd like to mention a couple of local issues on the front burner and get panelists' comment. One is the University of Oregon has applied for developing 77.4 acres of riverfront along the Willamette River. If you're from out of town, this is a main tributary of the Willamette, and it would include acres of plastic, chemical, athletic fields lighted 24-7 and fenced. Um, this is a 30-year permit. The, the university could build dozens of large buildings, but has no legal requirement uh, under the permit they're asking for to actually mitigate the riparian zone along the river. There's two weeks open to public comment, and uh, Monday the city council will uh, hear from people about this, so I'd encourage people to make their opinion known. The second one is, uh, and I'd like panelists' reaction as to how we might deal with these, uh, is a wildlife feeding ban that was passed by Eugene in July. The first case has just come from that. A lady in southwest Eugene has been given a ticket and at, told to, she might be fined $2,000 a day for providing water in her backyard for animal habitat, feeding blue jays. I've seen the backyard. It's a very nice backyard, but uh, this also uh, is an uh, overreach by the city code compliance authority because the ban was really cougar, bears, um, deer, raccoon, and turkeys, and, and uh, coyote. And the, only those animals were banned from being fed. Um, anyway, if you can, uh, make your public comment. And if you've had issue or if anyone knows about the Willamette Riverfront, uh, uh, issue, maybe they can make comment on that from the panel. Thank you. Uh, in my other um, non-rights of nature life, I run a coastal conservation organization. Uh, and the decision that we have to constantly make is whether, how best to approach the many problems, which are very similar to the kinds of things that you mentioned a desire for a new development in a so far undeveloped area that will further fragment and degrade the ecosystem locally. The problem is uh, you have to live, you have to work within the existing laws to hopefully get some traction while at the same time uh, advocating for a paradigm change so that you don't have to do this all the time. Uh, my, in my experience, which is fairly extensive with the current regulatory system on environmental matters, the regulatory system is broken. That's it, period, end of sentence, it's broken. Uh, it is uh, very much focused on uh, economic development, on private rights, uh, private property rights, uh, on uh, the need of local governments for further taxes, which they gain from further development. The difficulty is you can't go before a city council and say, I believe in rights of nature and because of that you shouldn't develop this parcel along the Willamette. They will say, you know, excuse you, uh, that's not one of the criteria that we have uh, to make this decision on. 
so it puts us, it puts everybody who's concerned about these kinds of things in a kind of a dual position. You have to use the existing regulatory system, which is broken but can still listen to overwhelming public input, and at the same time advocate for a change of consciousness in a different system. Uh, there isn't any way to end up with a holistic environment and a holistic consciousness that relates in relationship to the environment if we continue in the same regulatory system. It won't happen. It's based on systematic uh, or uh, not non-systemic, symptomatic way of thinking. Uh, it's based on money. It's based on my right to do more or less what I want inside certain constraints. Remember when you grant a permit for something, you're giving permission for it. You're, a permit system is not a system for saying no. A permit system is a system for saying yes. Maybe with some conditions on it, but basically for saying yes. So I've often been in situations just like the one you're discussing. In fact, I'm in several of them right now on the coast where we have to do two things. We have to advocate within the system using the existing laws and the existing criteria and the existing standards and try to get traction to stop an ugly project while at the same time advocating for a system change. What it comes down to in shifting our consciousness is going back to the way the indigenous cultures lived. They owned what they could carry. They did not own the land. They used it communally. We do not own anything that we cannot create. So we must care for what we do not own because that becomes the legacy of every generation for all time. Do we have the right to degrade it before we pass it on? I just want to make one comment that's a little bit tangential but I think related, which is that there's another pathway besides passing laws and then having court rulings that rights of nature can and is being implemented, and that's through um, executive agencies, bureaucracies, who incorporate the rights of nature framework just into their normal regulatory schemes. Um, and a good example of that is Santa Monica. Now, to do that, obviously, you have to get the buy-in of the leadership, uh, and that comes through training and education over time, but it can is happening. So in Santa Monica, uh, you know, the, the lawyers working for the city were really uh, resistant, but the Earth Law Center and some people worked with them over time, and then they were persuaded, and eventually they just uh, incorporated the rights of nature framework into their sustainability plan, which they were going to have anyway, uh, and then they've been experimenting and pioneering with a bunch of other ways that um, city governments can implement rights of nature without laws or the courts, like using their existing communication systems that they have to educate citizens and make it clear that that's a value, uh, make it part of the discretionary approval processes, for example, for like land development proposals or incorporating into zoning ordinances and things like that. Remember, we can't convince anyone of anything. To allow people to change their thinking, we must protect their dignity, not destroy it. Everyone is right from his or her point of view. There is no wrong. It's right, right, and different. The question is, how do we negotiate the differences so everyone's dignity remains intact, which allows them to raise their level of consciousness? And it comes from inside then, as we take better care of ourselves, we take better care of the land. For the last 10 minutes, we've been talking about laws and trying to look at the rights of nature well, what I see right now is that we have more corporation rights than rights of nature. That's obvious. How did these corporations get rights that became laws? Obviously, what has to be addressed is this whole issue of lobbying through corporations. From a legal standpoint, unless we could stop that and address that their rights don't represent the rights of nature or life, you know, then I think that's a cultural a thing we have to address is the corporation rights versus the law of rights. Yeah, that's a very important point, and we devoted a whole uh, chapter in this book to the problem of corporate rights. Uh, it might surprise people to know that corporate rights is not, uh, it was never passed in a law. Congress never passed a law saying corporations have rights. 
It's a court-created uh, doctrine, largely from the United States Supreme Court. And it didn't, of course, emerge kind of all at once, although there was an initial case that uh, came out with the statement that corporations do have rights. And over time, the US Supreme Court and other courts uh, in concert with it have expanded corporate rights so that they now have many of the rights that we thought, theoretically, uh, apply to individuals and not corporations. Uh, further problems are that corporations are now not just international but transnational. Uh, they can do a piece of production here and a bit of production here and the gathering of the products here and the transportation to here and the purchase over there. Uh, and no one country's laws can easily uh, get it, their hands around, so to speak, uh, the entirety of the corporate um, activity. And that's especially true for seriously environmentally damaging projects such as large mining projects in Peru or in Indonesia, which destroy thousands of acres of land and uh, indigenous livelihoods and cultural areas. Uh, the problem of corporate rights is one that corporations zealously defend, of course. Uh, and the courts uh, in the United States, having gone down this road, seem to be only strengthening this road. Uh, there is a national movement called We the People, whose uh, sole focus is a constitutional amendment restricting the rights uh, in the Bill of Rights to human beings uh, and not to corporations. And that is something that would have to be passed by every state in the union as a constitutional amendment does. So it's a long-term process, but it's a recognized problem and there's an organized response to it. The basic problem is corporations would be giving the right to personhood. Yeah. So they're in competition and they're bigger, stronger, and richer. Okay, so I just want to thank everybody for being here, including our panelists. <laughs> and I wanted to remind you, we're going to be working on our Rights of Nature ballot initiative here in Lane County. So if interested in helping, look us up, sign up. We have a sign-up sheet over there. Get involved with us. And will make rights of nature recognized here in Lane County and beyond. Thank you. <laughs>